Welcome to this video on and production economy with workers and capsis. So for the code here, I will be using the simple namespace from, from types. If you haven't seen this or can't remember it, I will talk a bit about it later. Then I will use NumPy and I will use Optimize from SciPy and I will do the uh, auto reload thing and I will use at the end some, uh, uh, some code from this production economy uh, uh, file. I will just get started. I need to choose my, my kernel here. So that's that's running. Uh, but let's talk about the model. So the model I'm considering is an economy with NW workers and NC capitalists and a single firm that's owned equally by the capitalists. The workers, they consume something, CW, at a price, P, and supply labor, LW, at a wage of W. Uh, the utility maximization is getting utility from consumption, where you get utility from the consumption itself, plus some additional uh, cover, and you get this utility uh, from uh, from the labor supply. And there's a budget constraint, you cannot consume uh, more than you have in wage income. Uh, you can substitute the problem into the, uh, uh, the budget constraint such that it becomes a problem only in the labor supply, and it looks like, uh, like this. And we denote the optimal behavior as C star W as a function of PV and L star W as a function of P and W. Uh, the capsules, they consume uh, in the same way at the same price and they supply labor at the same uh, wage, but they also receive, receive profits. They have the same uh, consumption and utility functions, but have this, this extra component in, 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 in their income. Uh, and this is uh, therefore their sort of uh, uh, substituted uh, problem. They choose a labor supply, uh, but compared to the workers, they get this this extra income from the from the profits. And we denote the optimal behavior in the same way, uh, just with this extra pie, this profits in there. Then the firm they use a production function that is just uh, ill uh, raised to uh, to uh, to alpha. Uh, between uh, uh, 0 and 1 for this alpha, and they maximize the profits. So they take the price and the wage as given. And the optimal behavior here is simply uh, the how much labor is used by, by the firm, which implies production by putting it into the production function, and imply total profits by, by calculating the profits, by multiplying the output with the price, and subtracting the labor costs. An equilibrium in this model is a standard Valra equilibrium, so it's a set of prices such as workers, capitalists, and firms act optimally, giving these prices and the profit uh, for the capitalists. And the goods market clear, such that if we take how many workers are there and how many capitalists are there, multiply with their respective consumptions, then we get output. And if we take the labor supply of workers and capitalists and multiply with the number of them, then we get the total uh, uh, labor demand from the firms. And the profits are equally distributed for the capitalists. So we take the overall profits and we divide by the number of capitalists. And then we have the, the profits of the capitalists. We will use P equal 1 as a numeraire. Uh, so that will disappear uh, at some point. Uh, um, and we will note that Valras law implies that if one of the markets clears, then the other clears. So we actually only need to clear one of them. Okay. So let's start by setting up the parameters. So here I'm just choosing some uh, uh, some parameters. Doing this way, I'm using this simple name namespace such that I just write part dot kappa to get uh, uh, kappa and uh, the value in into this and so on. This is very similar to a, a a dictionary, right? If this was a dictionary, then we would write something like like this, and then we would write etc. Uh, so that's the same, it's just a, I like this notation up here a, a, a bit more, uh, so that's why I use that. It's it's very similar in the sense that you could actually write par, and then you can write underscore, underscore, dict, and then you actually get the simple namespace base here just as a dictionary where you can use sort of the, the standard uh, uh, notation for that. So, but I, I, I like this, so that, that's why I, I've organized it in, in, in this way. Then let's start with the workers. So for the workers, we will use uh, two functions. So we will use what is the utility uh, of the worker for a given 
uh, choice of consumption and, and labor and the parameters, which we now all pack into to this par, uh, which is sort of a smart way to pass around all the parameters. Instead of having a long list of them, we just pass in, in par here. And we calculate exactly uh, the formula that was for their utility. And then we say, okay, for the workers, we want to maximize their utility. So we make an objective function, which is a function only of the labor uh, supply. And we say that that's minus because we were using a minimizer of the utility, where we, in the place of consumption, we put in uh, the wage uh, uh, income divided by, uh, by the price. Uh, so we use that, that the uh, uh, preferences are monotone uh, uh, in, uh, in consumption. And then we just call, use a minimize scalar function from optimize to call it within the bounds that we had for, for the labor supply. And we found our, our result and we put in our optimal labor supply choice and the applied optimal consumption choice. So if we, if we run this, then we have just defined these functions. Uh, and of course, we might be unsure about whether have we actually done the right thing. And it's always good to sort of do a small test uh, on a small part of the code. So one test I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, let's do wage change and then let's calculate what the workers are doing and let's see whether we can understand that. And you can see that as the wage increases, we consume more and we supply more, more labor. That seems like that, that could be okay. So let's, let, 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 let's go with that. Then for the caps lists, we uh, put in uh, the utility of the caps list. It's very similar to what we had before. Um, uh, so, so that's that's just uh, that's just uh, fine. Um, I think maybe one thing uh, that uh, no, fine. Uh, and then we maximize the utility of of the, of the caps list. We do that in the same way as, as as before. We can see now we need to remember that it's not just a function of the of the price and the wage, but also of the um, of, of the profits, which we are adding in here when we calculate the uh, uh, the, the consumption of the capitalists giving their their labor supply. Now we can run uh, we can run this, and we can um, uh, we can uh, run the same test as before, and we can see that it looks similar. We can always see one thing that that is interesting here, right? Is that I set set the pi equal to 0.1, and we can see that the caps list works considerably less uh, than the than the workers, which makes uh, which makes sense. Um, there might also be another way we could test the caps list behavior. Try to pause the video and think about what you would we would do. Maybe implement it. So one thing you could do, and there's, there's many other opportunities, but you could also say, okay, now let's change actually the labor supply, the, the, the profits such that we keep, we keep the wage fixed at one instead. And then we, we change the profits and we can see that, okay, this gets large, these, these profits. So there's almost no working. And we can see that they consume these profits uh, uh, almost one, one for one here. Uh, so that, that makes sense again, another good uh, uh, good test. So it's always good to think about uh, deriving these these kind of tests. Finally, we have the the firm. So uh, here we just have have one one function. It takes in the uh, the price and the wage, and it takes in the parameters. And it's saying, okay, what is the uh, production function? We just put in our formula for that. That's a function only of of, of labor. Uh, we take the uh, objective function that then sort of the we're again using a minimizer, so we take in minus, and then we take prices times the production function minus the uh, the wage bill, and then we will here we'll be using a just be using minimize. We could have been using uh, a, a scalar minimizer again, but here we will be using uh, minimize. So this is now actually over a vector, so it's a vector where we guess initially on the firm producing zero, and then we calculate. Uh, given this initial choice, what is the, the optimal uh, choice within some bounds where we have a lower bound of zero, but not an, any, any kind of upper bound. And we use this, um, uh, this method here for, uh, for doing it. So this, this is a, a, a method that allows for specifying uh, uh, bounds. Once we've gotten the result out, we put it into the optimal uh, choice. We find out what's the optimal production 
is and we find out what is the uh, the total profit. So let's run this again. We've just defined it. We can do a small test. We can see what happens uh, when we keep the price fixed but increase the wages. Uh, we can see that production falls, uh, the labor used falls, and profits fall. All makes uh, fine sense. Okay, so now we have our three bits. We have the, the firms, we have the, the capitalists, or we have the, the firm and the capitalists and the, the workers. And now we need to put it all uh, all together. This might be sort of this is what we need for the equilibrium. This might be a good idea for you to pause the video here and think a bit about how would you do it. Uh, it probably takes some time some time to implement, but it's a good idea to ha have some sketch in your head about what you would your what you would do so you can follow better along. So the way I'm doing it, I'm saying okay, we need a way to evaluate the equilibrium. And we will want to use uh, P as number rare, so I make this a function of the wage. And then, of course, all the parameters. And then I allow the function to take in either a value of P or a, a value for, for something that will be do, do, print, which we will talk about it in the end. If I just keep the none for P, then I set P equal to, uh, to 1, otherwise I will use the value for P. And then I say, okay, now if we know P and we know W, then I can solve the firm problem. So I can get all the firm behavior out. I can calculate what are the profits per capitalist. Uh, and then I can find the optimal behavior of households for the workers that just require the prices. For the capitalists that requires the, the profit as well. But I get all, out the, the optimal uh, choices. And now for the goods market and the labor market clearing condition, I will just multiply in with the number of, of workers and the number of uh, capitalists. And then I will subtract production and labor demand to get whether uh, these things balances. So remember, this is exactly the formula that was up in the math, in the definition uh, up, up here, just where I subtract the right-hand side on the left-hand side. So I said, if it's zero, then we have an equilibrium. Then I can either, if I have two print, then I will sort of calculate the utility of, of the workers and the capsules, and I will print various information out. Otherwise, I will return the goods market uh, 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 clearing. So I'm assuming here that we will focus on goods market clearing, uh, and then we will use Valras law to ensure that we have labor market clearing as well. But let us define this one. And again, uh, it's good to sort of to, to do the simple things you can do. And the simple thing you can do is you can sort of try out various wages. So let's try out 10 wages between 0.1 and 1.5. And let's calculate what is the, the grid for the market clearing. So I loop through the grid and I evaluate the, the, the equilibrium each time. And I print out uh, what the excess demand is, is here. And you can see when we have a low wage, then we have a negative excess demand. And when we have a high wage, then we have a positive excess demand. And we want this to be zero, right? So we know that we want to, to search in, in between these, these two uh, things here. So our second step is find where excess demand changes sign. And the way I do that is I say, let's take the grid of wages where the grid, where the market clearing is negative. And let's take the maximum value of the wage in that. That will be the left-hand side. So that's this is the maximum value for that. And then do the other thing. Let's keep what are when are the goods market clearing positive. So that's all those up here. And let's take the minimum value. So that will be this value here. And then the equilibrium price must be in this in this ratio here uh, in this interval here. And then we'll just use a root finder, uh, uh, an equation solver, uh, to solve this. So I will say I want to, opt again from optimize, I will use root scalar, and I will use this um, evaluate e equilibrium function, where I will search between the left and the right values I just calculated, and then we use the bisect method. And I will remember that I need to pass in the additional arguments that were in power. And then I will find out what is the which. Great, so actually now we have solved uh, the whole uh, equilibrium uh, uh, here. Nice. Let's look a bit more into how, how, how it looks. So now we know the wage, so we can call the evaluate equilibrium again, but now with this do print 
set equal to true. So now we get some uh, some results out, uh, and there's a various things we can we we can uh, we can uh, look at. So we can see okay the workers they consume far less and they supply more labor, so they have much more uh, negative uh, utility than the capitalists. So this is clearly a world where it's better to be a capitalist than to be a worker. Then we can ask ourselves, do both markets clear? And we can see that the goods market, it clears uh, almost per definition, because that's what we did up here. We sort of we said we wanted that to clear. Uh, but we can see that the labor market also clears approximately. Uh, again, this is this is uh, sort of small numerical stuff that implies that we might not we haven't solved it uh, uh, exactly up here. So a small thing will uh, sort of uh, go over here again. So, but these are small numbers. So approximately both markets clear and we're good. You might want again sort of it's always good to think about how can I check my results. So one thing we could do is we can say okay. I know that I just chose the P as a number rare. So let's take my price and multiply it by some factor, here 100, and let's do the same thing with the wage. So the relative price is unchanged. Then I should still have an equilibrium. And you can see, if I do that, all the behavior of the workers and the capitalists are the same. We cannot see any, any differences. And we can see that the market, uh, goods market and labor market still still clears. The errors here are slightly uh, slightly bigger, but they are they are they are just still they are still so small that we just call it sort of numerical error. I don't I don't care about it. Okay, so this is basically how you solve this equilibrium. Uh, you could do a number of experiments here. It's easy to extend this model in many directions. Should the workers or capitalists have different tastes or different productivity? Should it be a government that does some redistribution or should you have any other, other ideas? It's a good idea for you to try out some of these experiments because that's the best way to learn to learn code. That is to experiment with it, do something that you're interested in finding out. And this way you can, you can dig more, in, more in, into it. The final thing I want to talk a bit about is Actually, you can also do this with a class. So here, I from the production economy file, I uh, import the, uh, the production economy class. So let's import this. And if you look inside this, it's very much the same code. So let's open the file. Uh, you can see that when it sort of initializes the, uh, the model here, then it sets up apart from simple namespace. It put in the same parameters. It puts in the values that we had we wanted for for grids, and it set up a a solution a name namespace where we begin with the price and the wage, and later we will uh, we will perhaps be able to add more stuff if we wanted to. And then instead of having functions for each of these things, then we have uh, uh, methods that put in the uh, the utility of the workers the workers problem and all these things. They're exactly the same sort of code lines, but they're just written as methods instead of as functions as before. There are a few nice things about that. One thing is that now you just, okay, this is just a function of consumption and labor, and you actually unpack the, the parameters inside the method instead of sort of having it as an input, which is perhaps a bit easier. And you sort of, you have a, a very well organized uh, 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 code in the, in in this way, it's exactly sort of the same the same functions. Uh, they're just set up in a different in a different way, and they're sort of put together in this production economy class. So the way you use this is you sort of you set up the uh, the model by calling the class, initiating it, and you can see, for example, then model dot shows you what's the value of kappa or whatever everything else you want to to find out, and then you can call the find equilibrium method. And it will find exactly what, what's going on. So then, the, sort of the nice thing here, right, is that you go very quickly from defining to solving it, and sort of the complicated code is is in another file, so you don't need to care about it when you present results, which is nice. Um, as I said, there's, there's a fewer inputs and outputs, which makes it less uh, a smaller risk of of changing the ordering. 
there's an easy access to all data that that's in the class. So let's say I wanted to calculate the the total consumption of workers and capsules and, and then sort of what the share is. So I can just take the model. Now I know from the parameters I have the uh, the value, uh, the number of workers, and I can calculate with their optimal um, uh, consumption choice. I can do the same thing for the capsules, and I can calculate what is the the capsules share of consumption. And here it's a, it's a half, even though there there are much fewer capsules than there are workers. It's also easy to experiment with different parameters. So if you want to have a lower kappa, then you could just take kappa and the and uh, divided by 100 and you can find the equilibrium again and see how that changes. I think the equilibrium rate gets uh, gets smaller um, uh, basically because now the consumers have sort of less uh, free consumption so they need to to work more so labor supplies increased and therefore the the wage is 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 lower. So you might think that this way of having this class and and having this this in it and putting it up in this way seems more complicated but the thing is you have a very well organized code here and it's very easy to do all the experiments that 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 you want so it's a good idea to understand how this uh, this class uh, these classes are working thank you that was uh, all for this video